and we are live. So welcome everyone to the fifth research software hour where we are here to talk about all the stuff needed for research that no one ever tells you, except us, of course, and your they colleague, which the, and your colleague, which the university has fired since they're not productive anymore. <laughs> Yeah, welcome. So nice to to see you all back here on the on Twitch. Uh, my name is Hadovan, streaming from Trobzo. Also, super happy that today we have we have uh, Sarah with us. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So, if this is your first time, um, we're a pretty informal show. We talk, we discuss things. We especially like making mistakes on stream because that's when you really learn stuff. Um, to chat with us, you can use the Twitch chat, but it's better to use the HackMD. And you can find the link in the channel description down below. So with this, then you can, we can more easily track what everyone's saying and then answer, um, answer asynchronously and threaded and all that good stuff. So if you open it up, it's pretty easy to see how it works. Just give it a try. Any there's other... an edit, edit button, either top right or top left, mm -hmm. which between edit and view mode. Right, you have to switch it to edit mode. Um, any other? Also, oh, sorry. Oh. oh, go ahead. I was just wanted to say that uh, yeah, about the jingle, if somebody is good at creating jingles, it would be really fun to have for next time. So contributions welcome. So. Um... Should we get started? So as you notice, we have a guest this week as well. We'd like to do as often as we can. This is Sarah Gibson, who works as a research software engineer at the Alan Turing Institute in the UK. And I first met her last year, I guess, through Jupiter Hub work. And well, so when preparing for research software hour, I thought, or we thought that we should interview with someone that's actually working as an RSE and has that title. So we can hear how it sort of goes and what the benefits to research are. So we've got some questions to ask and some stuff to discuss. So should we just get at it? Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Well, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a research software engineer? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> I ha hold a PhD in astrophysics that I got from the University of Leicester, and I was doing a lot of computational work. Um, I was studying um, gamma ray bursts using this automated um, satellite that was put into orbit by NASA. Um, so I couldn't do a lot of hands-on observing because they weren't going to send me to space anytime soon, but um, I got very much into sort of like digging through the data, making models, you know, optimizing um, these models to fit my data and, all, and and then visualizing that and creating my papers and such. When it came to the end of my PhD, I kind of knew that the academic career route wasn't going to be for me. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't really, yeah, I felt a bit sort of flattened and by it all. And so I started actually looking for data scientist jobs because when you're when you're a PhD student in physics and you go to all of the non-academic career days, they're like, you're already 95% a data scientist. <laughs> I was like, cool, I'll go and do that then. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend forward, forwarded me the job in advert for the Alan Turing Institute's um, research engineering group. Um, I still need to buy him a beer for that because it's probably the greatest thing that's ever happened. But um, yeah, I kind of put in my application, um, slightly imposter syndrome being like, this is mm. the Alan Turing Institute, you know what I mean? Um, mm. But amazingly, thankfully, got through the um, got through the interviews and started working as a data scientist, a research data scientist. Um, so I, I had that title up until about December last year. And one of the great things about the Turing's Research Engineering Group is we see these two job roles as research data scientist and research software engineer as two ends of the same spectrum. So we actually only have one job description for both roles and candidates are allowed to self-select and we are allowed to change our job titles as well, although I think I am the first and only to do it so far. But yeah, I was working on a, um, a few 
I had a science project and a software engineering project as well. Mm. And I just found myself vibing a lot more with the software engineering um, than the disc science. So I asked to change my title and that's how I kind of came to be. Okay. So what is research software engineering? Maybe you have a better d definition than we've been giving people here. Yeah, so um, I looked up into this because the, the former director of research engineering at the, the Turing is uh, James Hetherington. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he was part of the, the group who originally brought this term about. Um, so I did some digging. There's the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK, which um, helps advocate for research software and the sustainability of that, the reproducibility mm -hmm. of that. And James was a fellow a few years ago, and I'm a fellow this year. Mm -hmm. And back in 2012 at their collaborations workshop, they had this discussion around that there were lots of people in academic institutions mm -hmm. who were very technical and had um, a broad range of technical skills, but they also had um, a really good working knowledge of how, how you do research, mm -hmm. how you get to the answers. Mm -hmm. And... Um, what they saw was they, they saw a lot of people, but they didn't have um, a way to be credited or recognized mm -hmm. or like praised for the work they were doing in the academic mm -hmm. arena. So um, yeah, the first thing they decided to do was come up with a name. So a research software engineer was born and that's kind of like grown into a society. So the idea of this research software engineer is that um, yes, we can code, yes, we can build your app or your pipeline or your workflow whatever but we also understand like how science and research is done so we can collaborate more with the researchers and talk about what kind of techniques we're using whether that be a data wrangling thing or an infrastructure um, mm -hmm. or like an infrastructure thing um so we're a bit more frontline um and a bit more long term across the development of the project rather than just coming in at the end mm -hmm. and packaging up the code mm -hmm. that has been produced so far, we're much more involved in its long-term development. Yeah. I also heard a description, you might hire some consult consultants that come in and wave their hands and then leave and you're left with a bunch of stuff you can't use. So I guess like, yeah. So as a research software engineer, what do you do and how does it benefit researchers and science compared to other solutions that people might find yeah so as i mentioned before the turing's um idea of this research data scientist and research software engineer um the kind of two ends of the same spectrum so what i do kind of varies day to day project to project even um so some of the very like software engineering things i do um revolve a lot around codifying infrastructure so what mm. i mean by that is um we might have you know some compute resources running in the cloud and one of the really nice things i like to do is to set up pipelines and such that can interact with those um deployments on the cloud from a github repo um using pipelines and stuff so i have quite a few kubernetes clusters running and I just really like that I can update those Kubernetes clusters mm. simply by merging a pull request on GitHub mm -hmm. rather than having to get stuck into the terminal and sorting out all of my credentials and mm -hmm. figuring out which thing I need to SSH into again and then doing an upgrade. It's all just automated and it's like a push of a button. Mm -hmm. And yeah. But then there's other things like I might be doing, like at the minute I'm working on a big project. We have quite a, we've got quite a large data set and we need to do some exploration on that to understand exactly what we have and what, if there's things that have been duplicated and such. So I've been running a script that kind of like reads in all these files and hashes mm -hmm. them. And then we can figure out which ones are the same or not. Mm -hmm. And we can start to piece together a pipeline for like cleaning this data ready for the researchers to do research mm -hmm. on it. So I guess the researchers can get started a lot faster then. Yes, yeah, like sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I also like the fact that like what you mentioned porting infrastructure to code and by doing that also the infrastructure becomes documented. It's not only automated, but it's also documented, reproducible. 
one hundred. Well, like remembering, I have to log in and to here, and I have to do this and this and this. Yeah. So really great for reproducibility. Also, I wanted to say that we really appreciate the comments um, on HackMD and and maybe questions to to, to Sarah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So when we Very were cool. talking beforehand, you had mentioned this uh, example of non reproducible code for the COVID decision making. Mm. Um, would you like to elaborate on that some? and how the software affects, or how the quality of software is really so important. Yeah, so I spend a quite a lot of my time talking about reproducibility. Um, mm. I, I'm involved in the Turing Way community, which is a guidebook for, well, it started out as a handbook for doing reproducible data science and is now working its way into a multi-volume beast of a book that mm. will, um, you know, tackle all areas mm -hmm. such as ethics and such. And so like the very basic definition of reproducibility, I most often talk about, maybe basic is the wrong word, like wrong word, maybe like fundamental. But the idea mm -hmm. is that if I give you the same input and the same analysis code, you mm -hmm. should be able to get the same answer I did. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be too difficult of a bar to reach, but actually more often than not, it is, and this mm -hmm. is because from a new, we talked about documentation. Sometimes we just forget to document things mm -hmm. and how we're using them, and you know we keep that information in our head, but we don't um, disseminate it amongst other people. It could be things like capturing the all of your dependencies in your computational environment is super difficult mm -hmm. uh, so getting the same setup in order to get the same answer is a little bit more trivial it is um is it not as trivial mm -hmm. um but ultimately if we can't if we can't just check that code is doing what we think it's doing mm -hmm. then how do we how can we have any confidence in the results mm. and um, the decisions we're making from those results? Yeah. And I think the the really strong the really strong issue with me in terms of um, reproducibility in this new COVID nineteen era is that it is the ethics. Like this is a life and death situation mm. for many people, and we are now we've got this very um, very difficult to negotiate tension between the need to output results and make progress quickly but doing it in a robust reproducible manner such that we're doing our due diligence we're doing our best practices we can mm. hand on our hearts say that the decisions we're making from this output is in the benefit of the the majority of people mm -hmm. um so that's why I think it's really important. Yeah, it's so important. Uh, yeah, so, okay. What next? Yeah, so we've been interested in starting some sort of research software engineering groups at our university to be able to provide this service to people, um, like to people at our universities. Do you have any advice or comments on that? Like, how can we let people know the benefit that a RSC could give them? Yeah. Um, hmm, that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, it's been quite tough for me, too, to figure that out. Yeah, like, proving the benefit of an RSC. Well, I think we've I've talked a lot about um, reproducibility and um documentation and automation a lot already mm -hmm. um so i think one of the greatest advantages having an rsc on board who are, who's going to implement those kinds of best practices that will help researchers be more successful in the long run mm -hmm. because if like once you get that infrastructure it takes it takes some time to get that infrastructure set up but once it's there, to be able to rerun your code in order to check a certain result um, that you published and to build on top of, mm -hmm. it becomes 
a much more efficient process because mm. yeah mm. once you start rerunning things and rerunning things regularly every time you make a change running your test suite automatically and continuous integration you can track those bugs down quicker mm-hmm. and as they come up rather than all in one go right at the end when you finally got another grant and you mm. need to start working mm. on your next research paper oh. so like you can yeah, it just takes some time and some effort to invest in at the beginning, yeah. but it will help you be more successful in the long run. And that is really what a software engineer can help you achieve. Yeah, it's really a challenge. So it's both like convincing hiring committees, but also a convincing funding agency to, to fund also RSE groups and to yeah. provide a possibility to progress in career and also build your own group of RSEs. Mm-hmm. It's a struggle, yeah. but it's something that's taking off. Um, I, we were talking in the pre-show chatter about the UK mm-hmm. RSE Society, and I know this popped up in Australia, in the US, in Germany, in the Netherlands. Like It's starting to become a popular thing. And mm-hmm. so I think you will have a lot of examples that you can point to mm-hmm. of where universities who do have their own um in-house rse teams Mm -hmm. um there will be examples where that has been a success yeah yeah maybe this is how it works Mm. yeah like i know um newcastle and bristol universities in the uk have big rse teams Mm -hmm. okay so i wanted to a little bit. I don't want to drift uh, away from uh, from uh, the RSE topic, but I know that you are in working in the Binder core team, mm-hmm. and, and I would like to say that Binder is a wonderful service. I'm, I'm really amazed. It's a it's a service where you can uh, host and run uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, R Studio environments, and much more uh, in the cloud dynamically so one can really share a reproducible pipeline which which runs dynamically i can go in i can connect with my phone and i can even go in and modify parameters and and rerun the pipeline rerun the analysis testings out i think it's like first time i set it up and it was so easy to connect mm-hmm. like all you need is a put the jupyter uh, notebook somewhere accessible can be even can be zenodo and uh, and a few more clicks and and you are up mm-hmm. so it's amazing Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask you, how, I mean, if you can talk about it, uh, I would be really interested. What is the, like, what is the infrastructure behind it? What is the tool? What are the tools behind the service? What are you? What is this running on? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so Project Binder, we're a group of data scientists and software engineers who are dedicated to reproducible research. And um, I've talked a lot about sort of like the theory of reproducible research in documenting things, automating things. And I said earlier on that capturing your computational environment can be super difficult. Well, Binder is the technological infrastructure that allows you to com- to capture that computational infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to use Python in, as an example, but Binder does support R, Julia, a load of other languages, anything you can install using apt-get and um, the Nix package manager, we, and it can support multiple languages at the same time as well. But as an example, if you're running a Python project, you'll probably have a requirements.txt file that mm-hmm. says um, all of the um, packages that are required for your um, analysis to run. And let's say, for example, you've put your analysis in a Jupyter notebook. So it's literate programming. You've got pros next to the code. You can have R notebooks. You can just use Python scripts and run them in the terminal. But we'll just use um, notebooks as an example for now. So what happens is you put all of your code and um, your requirements into a GitHub repository or a Zenodo repository or a GitLab repository, and you go to mybinder.org, and you put in the URL of your repository, and you click Launch. And what mm-hmm. happens is that triggers a series of events that results in uh, you getting a gener- generated URL that you can stick in a tweet, in an email, and send to someone. They mm-hmm. can click on that, 
and they are immediately transported through their browser into your computational environment with all of the packages installed, all of the code and the data there ready to run. They don't have to install anything. They just press go and it works. That's so we have, wonderful. yeah. I think it's, it's a great way to share also supporting information to our manuscript. Yeah, it's then... super cool for like sharing tutorials and um, like example analyses and all sorts of that. You asked mm -hmm. about the infrastructure underneath and we've got quite a few different tools. So um, the big heavy lifter that we have is a Jupyter Hub and its job is basically taking our users and mapping them onto some compute instance. Mm -hmm. So like they have some kind of CPU to run their analyses behind them. Our Jupyter Hub is one that runs on Kubernetes clusters in the cloud, which means it's scalable. So um, we can have a lot of visitors. We, MyBinder.org actually hosts over 150,000 launches per week. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> and, um, so Jupyter Hub t handles um, connecting users to compute. Mm -hmm. We have a tool called Repo to Docker. Mm -hmm. This is the tool that goes mm -hmm. and clones your repository. It builds a Docker image mm -hmm. that is then compatible with Jupyter Hub. So when um, the Kubernetes cluster pulls down that Docker image and spins it up as a Jupyter server, that then connects to your browser and you have all of the, um, you have the whole interface and mm -hmm. all of your files there and everything as well. So, and then Binder is kind of this thin layer on top of Jupyter Hub that works to sort of resolve URLs when you're like cloning from GitHub mm -hmm. and uh, to like redirect your browser when the server is ready. And it's and it's open source and it's a very Everything open, open. welcome community. Or that yeah, yeah. Work up support. We had it just before the the stream. We chatted about like where you would where the community would like to go, like more being more inclusive in terms of other tools and languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. We're all completely open source. You can um, deploy your own binder hub. A um, little bit of a self plug. I have <laughs> a tutorial on how to um, run bind uh, of how to deploy your own binder hub on the on Microsoft's Azure cloud platform. Mm -hmm. um, I can stick the URL in the um, hack and be later if that'll be useful. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have a Gitter channel. You can come and chat to us there. We have discourse for like support questions. And the great thing about Binder as well is that it's modular. So we have all of these different tools that work together to create mm -hmm. the entire infrastructure. So if you just want to work on Jupyter Hub, you can work on Jupyter Hub. If you just want to work on Repo to Docker, you can work on Repo to Docker. Mm -hmm. All of these tools work individually. We've then just combined them together in um, a Helm chart that's deployable onto Kubernetes to orchestrate them all working together. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the pro uh, Project Jupyter is a, a very wide um, community encompassing notebooks, NB converts, Jupyter Lab, all sorts. Um, so we get input. There's loads of pathways in if you'd like to join the Jupyter community. And also a little bit connecting to what we talked last week, one, one fun way to get involved would be to watch the community develop and how they communicate and how they make changes because there is a lot we can mm -hmm. learn from how how the mm -hmm. open community is self organizing. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Jupyter projects are I think pretty good to watch if you want to see open source being developed in a pretty open manner. So, so. I have uh, there is one question that we like to ask everybody, uh, and that is, <laughs> uh, I think I got it from Richard. I really like it. So, uh, what do you know now? that you wish somebody had told you when you started? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, use version control, man. <laughs> uh, so I was very, very, very green when I started at the Turing. Like, um, yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. even have a GitHub profile when I started at the Turing. Um, so they were like, we need to add you to our GitHub org. And I'm like, one more. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, mm -hmm. like version control, because that is the magic time machine yeah. you wish you had when everything has broken on a Tuesday afternoon and you wish it was Monday morning again. Yeah. So when you were a researcher, what was it, two years ago, how many other people used version control that you worked with? Was it almost zero? Pretty much. <laughs> I think I think once one of the professors, professors mentioned subversion to me, 
Mm -hmm. because I've got myself in one of these. I don't know what version of code I'm running against, what version of data I'm using, like corners. And then one guy started putting a load of stuff on GitHub, but it was Mm -hmm. just like, ah, no, he's he's just doing it to be weird. You know, it was like virtually no one was using Mm -hmm. version control. I'm so surprised at how rare this seems to be among almost everyone I work with. Although it's getting slightly better now, but still, like. I think it depends on which uh, uh, which domain you're working in as well. Mm-hmm. Like, I think um, some some of the bioinformatics domains mm, are yeah. a lot a lot further on than my old school astrophysics. Yeah. But interesting, yeah. I've had a few mm. discussions with like small groups of PhD students since joining the Turing and the impression I get is that the tide is turning and the advice that they want now is how do I convince my supervisor that it's a good idea for the <laughs> to learn how to do this mm-hmm. um, so, yeah. that's, a, that's a promising sign I'm also watching here the HackMD and we got suggestion that maybe one of the later episodes we should really look more closer at the binder service and and maybe make a demo that we yeah. show how to how to binderize a repository and how to make it live and how to make it how to deploy it. I yeah. have a tutorial on that too. <laughs> okay, ready to? Oh, yeah. we, we would like to place the links here. Yeah, yeah, I will do okay. that right now. Sounds good. Okay. And um, I'm working with some other people in my mm-hmm. community because again, this tutorial I wrote is in Python, but um, I've got some friends mm-hmm. in the R community community and Julia who are helping me translate um, this tutorial. So hopefully soon. Um, there'll be some other options that are not just Python. Yeah. Does anyone want to volunteer a repository that we come and binderize on stream? If so, submit an issue to the RSH notes or comment in the HackMD. Maybe we can use that as a live demo. So, which one would be a suitable repository? Something with a Jupyter notebook or it can be anything? Can be a fi- it can just be a .py file. So the the um, binder tutorial just starts with a .py file. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Let's do that. I have many more questions, but we also are half an hour in. Uh, Richard, what? Yeah. Uh... So should we? Well, next up, I have a quick demonstration and first thoughts on using SnakeMake. So I guess let's go on to there. So we'll have another question time for Sarah after I'm done with this in five or 10 minutes. So you can continue asking questions in the HackMD or other places, and we will get back to that shortly. Yeah. But also let me say thanks a lot. It's, it's wonderful that you're here and it's really inspiring and we will have uh, these nice follow-ups from uh, on working on Binder. Yeah. Thank thanks you. For thanks for having me. Great insight on the RC community. Thanks. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm transitioning to my desktop, and surprise, it works. So yeah, last time I gave a demonstration of my board game networks repository, and how it used a make file to try to convert the raw data into process data. So I said I would go and try to do this with Snake Make. Well, I've done it, so I've got some experiences for you. First of all, I thought it would be interesting to show why we might want to use snake make. So here is the make quick reference, regular make, not snake make. So it looks okay, but as you get down, look at all these really weird variable names here. So yeah, make is old and you actually have to know some of these, but um, I can never remember that. Yeah, I basically know now to search, make quick reference, and eventually find this page, and then it works okay. But anyway, let's look at the snake file. So this is the repository. Um, there's a file called snake file in analogy to the make file. And in it, it's sort of a mix of Python code and rules. So for example, in my make file, I defined extensions. Here I define extensions in what looks like a Python syntax. 
but you can really tell it's the Python syntax because here I define all of the networks in the file. So I glob wildcards wild and I see net dot blah. This net gets extracted out here. So it becomes all of the contents of this variable when it's been globbed. But here I use a Python list comprehension to remove everything that's in the www directory. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, at first I was looking for a way to just exclude something from the glob, but um, I could see there's some power to mixing Python like this. Then we define rules. So the rules are more verbose than make rules. So you have to do rule all, there's input, there's separate stances for input, output, shell script, which gets run but it's also more structured. So here we have input and there's multiple files of input and multiple files of output. So mm -hmm. the same meta variable gets substituted into, actually it's just a variable, not a meta variable, gets substituted into all of the other output variables all automatically, which is pretty nice. You can name certain outputs like this meta and stats. And here is the actual command that runs. And it's a shell script uh, put directly into the uh, snake file. It took a surprisingly long time to learn I can just triple quote it like this because it didn't work originally. And what I does learned. The set e, uh, what does the set minus e do? Uh, it's a shell. It says the shell should exit if there's any errors in any of these commands. But I've just learned that Snake Make does that automatically. So I am just removing this. Actually, I think we'll talk about that in a future research software hour. So here we see the shell stuff runs, um, runs commands. Here we see the inputs input.parse, input.network definition, and then output.meta and stats, which correspond to these things. So in this way, the syntax was kind of nice but you don't want to know how long it took me to figure out how to do all of this. Uh, despite having a tutorial, the tutorial is, I guess, good, but not as quick as I was hoping. So another rule that just runs stuff. This was a relatively complex rule. So there's the input is these other meta files, which got generated above. Output is well, uh, index.html file, and here's a slightly longer shell script, um, which before existed within the make file, now it's here, okay. And another rule for copy data, and then, so I should be able to do make, actually snake make, Uh, oh, okay. Uh -huh, Snake make. Oh, well, yes. Yes, I've done this in the last week. Something and run. So one thing that annoyed me about Snake make is I, you always have to specify the number of cores now. Apparently because people would use Snake make and say, why is it not parallel? It's supposed to be parallel. And in reality, they just didn't tell it to use all the cores that are available. Cores mm -hmm. equals one, and there's some error here. Um, I will get back to this error soon. So anyway, it's um, I've eventually found this way to make it work roughly like make for what I had before. Um, the things I like are that the syntax is more powerful than make. So you can express more things like, say, these expansions and so on that would take some really weird syntax in make. Um, Other things that you wish were different. Yeah, so I really like the simplicity of make. So I had to do a lot of extra hops in order to make um, make it do some basic things that make did. Like for example, here I, for output, I have to touch 
this copy data rule is done. And then here for making the data for GitHub pages, there's input and there's temp copy data, which is this thing. Well, in make, you could just do rules, something like uh, just directly relate one rule to another without the temporary files. Mm. One thing that really confused me is that I'm still working on. Here, I'm catting a file and trying to direct it to output. Let's see what happens when I actually run the thing. Uh, oh, OK. That is invalid syntax. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So look here cat, the input network, and the output. By the way, this is quite a bad way to generate HTML, but well, I'm copying what I had. Um, where's the redirection here? So this double this output redirection is missing from what's actually being run. And I have no idea why. So how can you not run a shell script like this? Like, it seems like it's breaking some sort of abstractions that I would expect to exist. Um, so is this the like the best practice to put the shell script kind of uh, inlined into the pipeline, or would it would one put it into a separate script and call that script as a rule? Or so probably putting it into a separate script would be a better idea. I was trying to make minimal changes to the make file to get here. Mm -hmm. Um, I also realized I had to do that here. So instead of trying to directly translate the make file, I had to go all into the snake file and put some, um, like really use all of its syntax. Um, so when would you recommend somebody to go for snake make? So and, and maybe do yeah. for some other tool. So I think if you're automating an actual workflow, like you have some starting files and starting data, which become some process data, which become some other process data. It's really good. You can do things like version the data. It's careful with the timestamps and all that kind of stuff. But here, I basically want to make a shell script slightly more modular. And I'm not that happy with it overall. Um, I can compare this to the make file I tried to translate. Um, so here, inputs, I globbed everything, extensions, outputs. Um, and then th these are the scripts here. Um, it makes all the network from this. I could basically skip over some unnecessary parts of the abstraction, and it worked mm -hmm. out fine still. And here, to make the GitHub pages, I can say run clean, set up all, and finalization. But when I've tried to do something like this, like if I do snake make, okay, one core, of course, clean, HTML, uh, it would do something like, see, the first time it didn't work and the second time it did work. Because the first time it tried to clean it, but then it had already computed what was done, so it didn't run anything else again, or something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it takes some getting used to, but well, it's a decent thing to look at for workflow automation. I'll try to use it a few more times in other projects in order to make better use of it. So a question we got, are there noteworthy alternatives to snake make? Mm, yeah, so really I started snake make because that's what code refinery teaches. Um, and I briefly looked at other things which would work, but like other things are were, but there were so many, so I stuck with what I knew I'd have to teach anyway. Yeah, if you have any suggestions for something that's more modern and um, yeah. perhaps doesn't have some of these things.
I think there are dozens. I will maybe mention one, which I don't know well, but I just discovered this uh, data version control. I will mm. say something about it in a moment. There was also this joke that uh, everybody accidentally invents a workflow during their PhD or postdoc <laughs> until yeah. they realize that 100 other people have also invented. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was talking with one of my friends about this, he said, yeah, apparently in bioinformatics, everyone has to make their own workflow management tool, which might sort of go to say about how difficult it is to make a very general purpose workflow management tool. Um, because there's so many different styles of doing things. Anyway, I think I went over my allotted time. So should we look and see if there's any questions here? Yes, um, let's see. Yes, so about the alternative, I will show one in a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice comments about, uh, about the interview with Sarah. Oh, thank you. And I learned something new, and that is how to how to specify where the comment comes from with name equals. So that's nice. I haven't seen that before, but I will use it from now on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree with Handa's comment about snake make and super old syntax. So yeah, like. I really yeah, did good. fight with it in order to make this work. It took a lot longer than I expected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, good remark here that it's read more often than programmed. Yeah. So readability really counts. Somehow, that is maybe true also for a lot of code. We don't think about it, but we write code and then it's done, but it will be read by a lot of other people. Oh. Who... I misunderstood the comment. So the comment was that make is has a super old syntax and students don't like it. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that <laughs> True. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can maybe mention one tool uh, that uh, was recommended to me. And it was as a reaction to a question we got through, through the GitHub issues. Hmm. And maybe I can take the screen, yeah. screen share. You've got it. So we got here an interesting question on on the issues list by Eric Eric Bach. And the question was how to organize. So we we often talk about how to organize code uh, with uh, version control, of course, uh, but how to organize also experiments. And I have to now clarify for colleagues from my community. So when I hear experiments, I think about glassware and lasers and instruments and spectroscopy. <laughs> so, but here, I think ex experiments was what was meant was uh, computations and uh, data, data input, data output. And it's a bit similar to what you now what Richard was discussing with SnakeMake. So we have code, and we have then the pipeline, and we have data. And the question is how to keep how to version the data part, the the experiments, and how to put it all together. And and I have to admit that I'm not an expert in this because in, in where I come from, we have we have been at least only publishing very little data. It's a few numbers, it's typically long calculations, very little data. But here, so one approach was uh, the example was that to organize the data, so how do we version data? To version it in terms of folders, so through a folder directory structure. And, and here, I think this refers to maybe a version of the of the model. And I have done similar things. I have also put the version information into the output itself. So the output of my model contained what was the Git version, what was the environment. So one solution to this, could be well uh, to use SnakeMake, put the SnakeMake into the, put the workflow into the same repository. There is this other tool that was recommended to me. I haven't used it. The only thing I have done is uh, going through a tutorial. It's uh, data version control. Uh, and a few things were really interesting to me. And I want to point them out. 
and where was that getting started configuring so here one can keep the metadata and the code in the same place the data itself can reside in in different places so it can be amazon it can be one of the storage systems it can be your own storage uh, solution and and then i can i can add add files very similarly like i would with git so instead of git add a source file i can do dvc add the data file and what it then does it adds metadata to my git repository and kind of zips these two together i keep both in one place what i also liked about this but again i have no really like real life experience with this tool and i would welcome uh, if somebody has or if you know alternatives but what i really liked about it i can also put pipelines into the repository oops and a pipeline it really looks very similarly to what we have seen here on snakemake so this is some pipeline we give it a name and it has dependencies so it depends on a, what's some python script and it depends on the data and it has outputs so this could be like a rule in snake make or make and i can add a number of these and they can depend on each other and then i can chain them and i can say i just want to have i want to reproduce this uh, this uh, model this result and it will go through all the steps and everything is versioned so i really like that it comes from the machine learning community but i guess it can be used for anything it's um, it looks language independent i would if somebody has experience i would really like to know so this would be my, if i would solve try to solve the problem i think i would try to solve it with this tool i think richard you had more experience than me with this yeah at one point i looked into it for using an object storage so here we didn't really want to move we didn't want to store workflows, but used it to move data around within a repository. And well, it looked good, but my first thought was, this is basically what Git Annex does. And I had spent right. some time learning. So the way it stores the actual data is just like that, but slightly less powerful, less configurable, but it looks nicer. Um, right. And one so thing this that- is another... yeah. Sorry. One thing that really turned me off was when I first used it, it said, we are sending data back to our company for analytics if you want to opt it out. And it gave me a really bad feeling to recommend something that had default on analytics um, and remote communication. So I sort of stopped caring mm -hmm. quite so much then. Um, but just for data, I would use Git Annex, but Honestly, its user interface is probably less good, but more powerful. Um, the website, a lot less pretty. Um, yeah, that's but yeah. Funny, but there's also a bit of a large file storage, which I think is similar, maybe the same thing, I don't know. So I think similar idea. large file storage is a centralized way of storing files. So each repository can only have one upstream remote where it stores everything. I don't remember how DVC is, but Git Annex is actually redistributable where the file remotes can be basically any. It really has the spirit of Git more. Um, yeah. Right. We have uh, not much more than 10, 11 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, I have something to show about auto formatting. And we have a few more smaller tips and tricks. Should we move on to yeah. auto format with us? Yeah, this was an idea that came up on Twitter. So Radovan, let us know. Yeah, the question was, so this was about auto formatting of C++ code. The question was, uh, so Lucas Gertz, um, who asked the question, he's using uh, Clang format. The question was, is there any better tool, you know, anything else to recommend? And then, and I think, no, I think Clang format is the, at least to my knowledge, this is what I use. This is the, it's a nice tool. 
I will show it in a moment, really a quick demo of how it can auto format and how it works. So what, what I also like about it is that you can put these rules of formatting into the Git repository. So you can define them how you like it. You, here I want indentation four steps. And then everybody in the project can use the same uh, conventions. But there was a follow-up question and that was also, how can I apply only a specific rule and not all of them? And the motivation was that what if what if uh, my colleagues don't want to use auto formatting? What if they are against it? Mm -hmm. How can then I use only a part of it? And there we can have a bit of a discussion. So I think to my knowledge, one can with clunk format, one cannot apply only one certain rule. But what you what one can do is I can write this configuration file and disable everything else. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should show just very briefly how it works. And but we can also think about how can we convince our colleagues to maybe we can like opt out of uh, auto formatting instead of opting in and how can we transition a project from a manually formatted to auto formatted hmm. but let me show this mm -hmm. so i will go i will do it with this project that we mentioned a couple of shows ago it's a c plus plus python project and here i have this file somewhere where is it it's here and now what i will do i will mess up yep i will um, what did i do here i will uh, first reset my <laughs> reset hard hat i will go back to start and i will what i will do I will mess up a bit my C++ code. So instead of the bracket here, I want to have it over here. I will destroy some indentation. And let's make this really very narrow and uncomfortable. I will stage it. And now I will run the Clang format. Uh, in place, it will automatically find this configuration file if present, and then I can mm -hmm. run it on a, on some C++ files. And then there are more clever ways to run it on everything. So this, run. Mm -hmm. this modifies the file and saves it back yes, in the same spot. Yes, it in place. So mm -hmm. now you got modified. Now I can show again this tool that we have showed last time, div tool. Mm -hmm. So I can visually compare what was before the formatting and what was after. Can I zoom in? No. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's somehow visible. So it it brought my code back back to shape automatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These rules, there are super, super many, and you can configure it to your heart's content. Uh, but now how to convince colleagues to switch to automatic formatting, because not everybody is a fan. I think what I would try to do is to uh, let the colleagues maybe opt out of it. So for their files and their modules, maybe they can add a mm. configuration or like a pragma saying that please clunk format, please ignore this file. So it's okay. So it's a per file thing. So I was wondering how does one opt out of this kind of thing when it's going to like the, when the next person whether... commits, it will auto format, but per file I makes sense. The way also functions. Uh, the all man is useful. Thanks for the tip. I think that's a specific format that one can choose. Also, what is very important for me to say is that when you transition from a manually formatted file to auto formatting, when people discover auto formatting, they are like, oh, yeah, great. Let's auto format everything. And I like to use it. So I also use black in Python. And, and then uh, I'm tempted to put it into, I want to have a pre-commit hook and I want to put it into the GitHub action and I want everything to automate. automate. But the problem then is, or you can have an, your editor automatic format, but the, the problem then is that you make a small change in the code, a small bug fix, and everything else in the file gets auto formatted. And it can be really a bit painful for the person reviewing the code because then the, the real code changes get drowned mm. in the auto, auto format code changes. So what I recommend right. to do is to, until the project is fully automatically formatted, to do that maybe in one separate commit, 
maybe also inform everybody about it because it can mean for them conflicts. Right. So everybody yeah. should know. And then, then once it's automatic, then I can put it into the pipeline and automata automate. Yeah, like, yeah, especially in this idea of separating the formatting commits from the content commits is really important. It really annoys me if someone sends uh, something back and then all the rest of the file has been changed. Um, I mean, I can see why they do it and every contribution is good, but yeah. So we have five minutes left. We have a few more small things that we can discuss. Also, what, what we would really like to, to have to get is a really difficult question that we cannot answer so that we can prepare something and do some research until next time. And it's called a stumper question, a word I didn't, I didn't know. So stump yeah. us with a really difficult question. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about this. So I saw that you have this new VE. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess we could have a look at that or something else that you yeah. something interesting that in, that you learned recently that we can show the last few minutes yeah well, questions always welcome and uh, well, then we will discuss them too yeah so I uh where's my screen so I wrote a alias echoing Radovan's one for virtual environments in Python which is well interesting but not that interesting overall a typical case of reinventing something that probably everyone else has already made themselves um but so i was wondering what do you think is the best way to distribute these things i have this i have my own improved git bash prompt stuff so if i put it into just my own personal settings it's not very findable or reusable what do you put in one of these in one repository? Or is there some repository of bash RC configurations and way to share it without expecting everyone to copy and paste it? So here I started a new repository for this here uh, bash RC repository with just that in it. but. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes for small things, I put them into like um, a gist. Mm -hmm. I also collect my uh, aliases into you know repository in like dot files uh, or my Z shell or my fish. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have a configuration repository, and then every time I install my pre-installed laptop, I yeah I can clone it. It's all the same. So just what is oh my Z shell and oh my fish? I've heard of these several times lately. I get the idea it's some way to distribute configuration files or like... Yeah, I think it's it's I... a set of, um, uh, I'm not sure alias this, but a set of uh, prompt behavior completion and visuals that many people like. And you can, you can use it, but of course you can fork it and adjust it mm -hmm. to your liking. And I, th I think I started with this all my fish and then I configured it a bit. So I changed it a, okay. a little bit. So it's the thing you use by f cloning and then forking for your own yes. personal states. Yes. And then I changed okay. the prompt a little bit. So I remove a few things, add a few things. I like to see mm -hmm. the, like on which branch I am on mm -hmm. and some colors, but not too much destruction. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you learned anything interesting lately? There was actually one that came up for me while debugging something. So I learned normally when I want to see which Python will run, I would type which Python, for example, and it shows this here. But then I was debugging someone and they had an alias, Python equals Python 3. And for mm -hmm. that matter, pip equals pip3. So then I would do which Python, and it would show this here. When in reality, when bash run, when I just type Python something, it would run whatever the Python 3 was, which in this case happens to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And in this case, pip3 is also the same thing. 
but in their case, there was no pip3. So I thought they were running this when in reality they were running their system pip3. I think you're so, not screen sharing. If oh, you oops. Screen sharing screen. There we go. Yeah. I wish I had noticed that before. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, which Python shows what the shell will run if I type Python? Then there was alias Python equals Python 3. And now, um, if I ran Python, it's not actually running what you see here. So from now on, I'm always going to use type dash a Python. And it shows me just what is Python. So Python is alias to Python 3. And then there's these two other Pythons here. So I can always be sure what's running. And that would have saved me 10 minutes of debugging a couple days ago. So. Yeah, so I, the thing that tools that I learned to use recently, and I put them there on the HackMD. So as some people know, I'm really excited about Rust recently. And many people are rewriting classic codes into Rust. Uh, so there are these alternatives to find, grab, ls, cut, and they are called fd and rip grab, xr, but, and they have nice colors. And uh, But what I really like about them is more intuitive flags, so I don't have to use uh, the man pages every time I want to mm -hmm. find a file with a certain pattern. So maybe more intuitive, nice alternatives yeah. to, to try. So which programs do each of these represent or replace grep is rip grep, obviously. Yeah, um, FD replaces cat, XR replaces LS, bat replaces cat. Uh, so bat. Yeah, sort of like classic tools reinvented without the backwards compatibility. Hmm. Although you can, of course, alias them. Yeah. So we are already here running over time. Yeah. Um, but so what we would really like to get a really difficult question, we, we really appreciate these questions through our GitHub issues and Twitter. And we would love to get a repository and we will uh, binderize it for you. Is that the right word, verb? Binderize? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We will do it live, live here in front of a live audience. And we would, mm -hmm. I think that would be a really nice demonstration how to, to, to show how how little work it is and how much more you get out of it. Yeah. So please send us repositories. Yes. So with that, I guess we can thank you for being here. And as usual, we hang around for a bit and answer any more questions and chat some and see what else y'all are up to. And thanks so much for Sarah Gibson for joining us today. Mm, and of course. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So has anyone have had any interesting bugs in the last week? I guess you know mine, an alias yes. of <laughs> Python to Python 3. And this it is wasn't why... like... Sorry. Go ahead. It wasn't so much of a bug, but on um, last week it was just too hot that my logic brain wasn't kicking in. Um, so I was like trying to fi um, hash these files and uh, and double checking file names to find duplicates. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, everything's coming back as a duplicate, and I just like use like an all function, um, mm -hmm. so, and like just kept getting like false back as like nothing's matching, and just propagated that faulty logic throughout the rest of my script. And then, yeah. <laughs> So that was more of like a human fallibility <laughs> issue. Yeah. I'm looking forward to some programming again. I've been in like many, many, many meetings and a lot of video and teaching, which is super fun, but uh, there was not so much time in for actually programming. Yeah. So looking forward to that. Yeah. We are now running this really huge workshop, which is Great, great fun. So we had uh, yesterday 160 persons on one HackMD. Wow. It, yeah. it was uh, getting sluggish, but then <laughs> it still yeah. kept up. 
I sort of wondered, we didn't even have 160 people in the workshop. So how did we get 160 HackMD yeah, viewers? Sounds, I think you, you told the stream participants to join. So at the, towards the end. That was still right. only 30 and we had about 100 people in the workshop. And I don't think most people even saw that. So. Of course, yeah. maybe it was some of the uh, HackMDs which got stuck and people restarted <laughs> the new. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I always thought when you go to a website and you see the site is overloaded, what's the first thing you do? Refresh, 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 refresh for a while, <laughs> just yeah. to make sure it will never come back. Yeah, I really hope we get more questions because that's, I think, the best way to prepare these sessions is to base them on questions. Yeah. And I'm excited about this repo, repo to Docker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, our first workshop had a lot more questions and interactivity than these later ones did. Any idea why? I'm asking the stream people in particular here, not just you all. Should we have shorter topics, more demos, more, more of something, less of something else? Mm, people are saying more advanced topics, which I think makes sense. So advanced in what way? I guess when we get advanced, then there's advanced C, advanced Python, advanced something. So the audience gets a little bit smaller, but maybe that's sort of expected when you're advanced, like you're able to understand um, understand the, the point of these other languages and what's going on. But yeah, okay. But maybe we can make them also more topical so that we focus on something advanced. Mm -hmm. Announce it well in advance. Yeah. Like maybe decide workshop themes and then make that workshop be all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I say, I wouldn't mind a whole week dedicated to learning about Rust, for example. I couldn't really help much, but that's that's fine. Can do a demo. Mm -hmm. I'm also recently really excited about coupling Python to Rust mm -hmm. and putting this on API. Mm -hmm. What about longer sessions? Like we could do one whole session or say 45 minutes of the session on one topic and go really advanced and in deep into it really sort of live programming stuff. Yeah, debugging. Mm. Also, I was thinking about profiling. Let me show really profiling, debugging. Yeah. OK, well, if there's not many questions, should we? Oh, there actually are more ideas there. Yep. I just had it's to scroll coming. down. Yeah. But maybe maybe we should close the show soon. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess with this being all, thank you, Sarah, for being here. It was thank great you. chatting and Maybe we'll have you on again. Maybe when will you be the one to demonstrate binderizing a repository? With I can do it. I've, <laughs> I've uh, yeah, so on it. Um, Kirsty actually posted in the HackMD. I'm running mm. an online um, workshop on June the 11th, mm. half day, where I'll be running through the zero to binder tutorial on mm. how to binderize a repo. So the, the Eventbrite link is in the HackMD and it's open to everyone. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay.
Well, thanks everyone thanks so for watching and thanks for all these good ideas I see down here. We'll have yeah, lots to do next week. Okay, so with that being said, goodbye everyone. See you next week. Bye.